So often when we think about, especially at a political level, about health, we think first thing about health care. The Ministry of Health spending money on hospitals, on doctors, nurses and other health care services. But really, when we look at the actual evidence, those factors, those services, well, they only have a, a minimal impact on the actual health outcomes, on whether or not we'll be well or sick, whether our lives will be long or short. They're important, but they're really after the fact. They're what we do when people are already sick. The things that make the biggest difference are really the, the social factors, the, the place and the conditions in which people live, how much money they make, how much education they have, whether they have access to safe housing and good food, what the wider environment around them is like. We call those the, the social determinants of health, and the evidence is very clear. That's what has the biggest impact on health outcomes. So if we're trying to influence health outcomes, we should be trying to influence those factors. So when we talk about health, we often get stuck on doctor shortages, wait times, the factors that are within the healthcare system that are, are causing difficulties. And of course, we need, to, we need to focus on those. We need to make sure we have the appropriate human resources that we're able to, to provide services when people get sick. But for some reason, that's what's what takes up all of the attention. It's where our focus gets stuck. And probably the best way to think about the problem there is this classic story of the baby in the river. Imagine you're standing at the edge of the river and you see a kid floating by trying to drown, flailing and sputtering. And you're a brave soul. You dive in and you haul that kid into shore. And that's great. You saved a life. But then along comes kid number two. And so you got to dive in again and save another kid. And then along comes kid three and four and five and six. Kid after kid, calling everyone you know to come haul these children out of the river, save their lives. And eventually, hopefully, somebody will scratch their head and say, hey, who keeps chucking these kids in the river? And they'll go upstream and try and find out. And I really think that's where we are spending most of our time is fishing the kids out of the river, dealing with the messes we've created or allowed to occur rather than moving upstream and preventing those problems. And it makes sense why people get stuck there. You get stuck with dealing with what's urgent and in front of you. But at some point we have to have the, the, the wisdom and the courage to, to step back a little bit and say, wait a minute, how do we actually change the situation so we're dealing with fewer crises? To my mind, the issue of health outcomes is something that reaches across partisan divides, reaches across political party affiliations. Health is something that everyone values. Every one of us lives their own health and well-being or their own sickness, their own morbidity and mortality, their own, uh, their own joys and possibilities. It, it's something that really is outside of what we typically think of as partisan politics. Now that doesn't mean that uh, the decisions made by every party have the same impact on health outcomes. And I think we do need to be encouraging people to, when they're reviewing what they're hearing from potential political leaders, to be asking that question. What's the point of government? What is it we're trying to achieve? And to my mind, the best health and well-being of the population seems like a pretty fantastic goal. So when we're looking at what potential leaders are proposing for us, we should be asking the question, how is what they're saying going to improve our health and well-being? How are the proposals that they're putting forward going to address income and its distribution, education, housing, nutrition? How are they going to influence the social determinants of health? When we have that kind of demand coming forward from the population, that's when we'll start to hear more from the leaders from the political representatives about how we can actually achieve what we want to, which is better health and well-being. Now, of course, the consideration of how do you pay for things always comes into account, has to be taken into account. The truth is, when you spend more money, if you take that upstream example, if you spend money maintaining your car rather than fixing it when it breaks down, you save a lot more. 
the truth is when we make investments, and I really think we need to start looking at the expenditures that we have on social programs, when they have to be wise investments, it has to be done well, but as investments in saving money in the future and having better results. When we have a healthy and educated population, our economy does better. When we have a healthy and educated population, we spend less time having to treat them in hospital or put them in prison. When you see the, the way in which uh, health and poor health education, poor social factors lead to more involvement in crime, that's something that worsens the quality of our, all of our lives and costs way too much. So I think it's about thinking about how we spend money in a different way as an investment rather than a way of cleaning up a mess. Historically, the medical profession has often been um, really focused on treatment and with good reason. We are the medical experts, that's what we do. We diagnose, we treat. But I think there's a growing understanding of those social factors, of the need to treat the causes of the illnesses that present to us as symptoms. There's a growing understanding of that, and even a growing frustration, a, a growing recognition of the limitations of the way we do things now. Certainly that's been my experience and of many of my colleagues to love what we do, love seeing patients, love diagnosing and treating illness and helping people in their time of need, but also frustration at sending people back into the situation that resulted in the illness. One of the recent things that I've found really interesting has been the Canadian Medical Association, which has often been seen in the past, rightly or wrongly, as really looking to serve the best interests of doctors first, with patients being an important factor but perhaps an afterthought. Now we've seen a real emphasis on preventive care and on the determinants of health. The last several presidents have really been talking uh, prominently about the determinants of health and the need to focus on health equity. And they even released a paper recently on the physician's role in health equity. And what was seen in the development of that paper was one, there's a real interest in lots of people doing creative things like Dr. Block and his uh, tool to assess and address poverty in his patients innovative mechanisms, but that there's a, there's a need on the part of physicians for more assistance, where we, we know about the social determinants as a concept. We know that our patients are living in poverty or struggling with uh, poor access to housing, but we don't have the tools in front of us to help address it. So really what needs to happen is the development of more tools and more skills among physicians to do the advocacy and the connecting to supports that are needed for patients. One really example of a way in which people are actively addressing the determinants of health is Dr. Gary Block, who's been assessing poverty in patients and learning the ins and outs of the social support system and the income support system in Ontario and helping his patients to access more income, really prescribing money for his patients, recognizing just how much that influences health outcomes. I think another great example is the community health center model. I'm fortunate enough to work in the Westside Community Clinic, a community health center that involves doctors, nurse practitioner, social work, physiotherapy, outreach workers that are going beyond the walls of the clinic and connecting with people in their homes, uh, and more and more services, I, I could go on and on, really looking at what are the, what's the whole picture of what a patient needs and how do we go beyond just a clinical encounter to a, a deeper relationship and a, a, a more active way of, of advocating for their health needs. One of the first things that governments could do to address the determinants of health is just start integrating that into their way of looking at decisions. This has been tried in other countries with a model of health in all policies. And I think that's something that Canada really needs, where you recognize that if health is influenced by more than the healthcare system, then the political view of how you achieve greater health needs to go beyond that. And it really ends up encompassing everything that we do. If you look at that list, income, education, housing, employment, food security, the wider environment, that's the stuff of politics. 
So if we, at every level, whether it's highways or the economy or the environment, always have that lens in mind of how will the decision we're about to make improve the health and well-being of the people of Manitoba or Saskatchewan or uh, Toronto or Canada, um, that will really change the way in which we, one, design the programs, and two, measure whether or not they've been successful. And that's what I think is really interesting about this shift towards health as the goal. Health as the political goal is it gives you a goal that's at once valuable, something we all care about, but at the same time measurable. And we measure it all the time. We measure morbidity and mortality and life expectancy. And we've even gotten to the point where with sophisticated modeling techniques, you can see how a policy decision will affect small groups or even individuals. So it allows you to project and evaluate the decisions you've made based on whether or not they actually improve people's lives. So when we look to talk about addressing the health needs of those who are most marginalized and putting resources into that, which is in some ways an abstract concept that can be a distant other. You might not necessarily have a, a relationship with people living in those circumstances, whereas maybe nearly everyone has a, an, a great aunt or something that was waiting for a hip, uh, hip replacement. It might be closer to home for the, for the mainstream population. It, it can be a bit of a challenge to bring that message across. I think there's two things that need to be done. One is talking about um, stories, really sharing stories so that people put a face on that problem, so that it's not some demographic characteristic, but it's Susan or Jack, somebody with a real story, and that you're able to really ha relate to that story. I think the other thing is to bring forward some of the evidence that is maybe surprising and not understood, but really important. For example, the work done by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in the book A Spirit Level, where they compared health outcomes in countries based on levels of income equality or inequality. And what they discovered was that the more unequal a society, the worse the health outcomes. Now that's not particularly surprising. You'd sort of expect more inequality, more poor people, poor people tend to be sicker, health is worse. But it wasn't just the poor people, it was everyone. If you're a wealthy person in a less equal society, your health is worse than someone who's at the exact same level in a more equal society. There's something about that greater inequality, whether it's more crime, more cost for public services, or just that tension of, of the, and stress of being uncertain in your position and far from your neighbors that creates ill health. And that to me is really interesting because it allows us to go beyond the altruistic appeal to help that other, uh, which you know, uh, works for lots of people. But many people would say, well, if we help them, I'll have less. My life will be worse. It's against my self-interest. But, but with that piece of evidence, we can say, actually, helping others, improving their lives, will improve yours as well. So when you help them, you help yourself. And that's interesting because then it's that the strategy meets the philosophy. The right thing to do is also bang on the smart thing to do. And that to me is really exciting because it opens, a, it opens a different kind of conversation than what we're used to having. My feeling is that this upstream thinking, this looking at preventing problems rather than cleaning them up once they've already occurred, it's not, new, it's not a new idea. It's not new information. And yet what we see for the most part, are governments responding to crises, short-term thinking rather than long-term planning. And what I really hope to see, and what I, what I believe is in that story, in that upstream story, is something that appeals to people across classes, across political spectrum, something that just makes sense. And I, I think we need to talk about that. We need to talk about what it is the government is for, what are we trying to achieve, how can we improve our health and well-being, and I'm really hopeful that that message will have resonance and, and that people will start to demand a better way of thinking.